Thanks for your patience. Thank you. 2020 is the year that keeps on giving, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, President Coble. Uh, the Finance Committee met last Wednesday and uh, covered a number of items. Items on the agenda tonight they recommend for approval on the consent agenda, item 6B, and also item on the budget financial, item 13. In addition to those discussions, we talked about a uh, debt strategies discussion for State Road 37. As many of you are aware, we're uh, going to have some budget overages there and how we're going to be able to do that and also be tax neutral for our citizens. Lastly, we talked about the budget coming up, and unfortunately, the uh, issue we're running up, the state's really not going to give us an amount of what our budget's going to be for our allocation until probably September, um, which is going to put us on a fairly fairly uh, limited time constraint to, to pass a budget, so we just need to be prepared for that. But they did uh, give us some caution in the wind to say if you want to estimate a number, estimate whatever last year's revenue was minus 10 percent. So we're going to have 90 percent of last year's dollars to, for our budget process. So uh, let's we're going to be prepared for a a tough budget season. We're going to probably see some cuts or see things very flat. So that's my report. Thank you very much. So, John, so my understanding is so they're going to give us our number late, but statutorily we still need to have our budget passed by the end of November? Is that, correct? that is correct. That is correct. We're going to have awesome. a, a, a short window here to pass our budget, so uh, we'll, be, we'll be prepared. The intent uh, with the Finance Committee is probably an A or B type budget where here's our, here's our best guess at what those numbers are going to be and we'll work towards a budget, and then there'll be a, okay, the sky falls, here's where our budget. So we'll, we'll be prepared to act and move quickly. We've never not brought a balanced budget forward, and that's our intent. We just don't know what the balanced number is, because in the, the number John is referring to is the income tax number. So we know what our property tax revenues will be. It'll be the income tax. They won't certify those numbers until the end of September, and that's, about 40% of our revenue comes from that number. Well, the one thing you don't need to worry about, Scott, is the food and beverage tax income. That is Because we don't have one. That's correct. Yeah. So we'll, we'll be ready. Uh, we'll be working with our finance chair and finance committee uh, in the coming months. But the reason normally we'd be further along in the budget process, but we're, we're slow playing this a little bit. I'm just now having departmental budget meetings. We'll be bringing this forward in August and early September to the budget committee or the finance committee, uh, excuse me, and then we'll adjust accordingly as soon as we know those numbers uh, in late September. Motion to approve. Motion by Thank you, Council President. Um, for the record, Megan Baumgartner, Director of Economic Development. The first item before you is the approval of Genizen Labs um, Statement of Benefits. So this is the form that we'll use each year to compare their um, compliance form, their CF1s, for their personal property tax abatement. So as you'll see on that, um, we've included it in the previous um, declaratory resolution and um, economic development agreement, their job commitment numbers. 
um, 40 new full-time jobs. I've heard from them recently that they're well underway for that and investing at least $7 million in personal property since they're going to be building out clean lab space um, and significant testing um, machinery. So this is uh, the first item is for the statement of benefits approval, and then the second is for the confirmatory resolution finalizing the designation as an economic revitalization area. I believe both of these items do need public hearing. Thank you, Chair. Your item one to approve R07-7002. So moved. So moved. Second. So moved. Second. Thank you again for the record. Megan Baumgartner, Director of Economic Development. Um, as Council President um, Kobo stated, this is for the Knowledge Services Confirmatory Resolution, resolution for 9800 Cross Point Boulevard. Um, this was the, in, related to the Fourth Amendment to their project agreement where they have now purchased 9800 Cross Point Boulevard and um, are underway with their renovations there. So we amended their agreement and are now offering their, them a real property tax abatement just on the new incremental value from any renovations that they might um, incur as a result of those renovations. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Megan. I'm going to go ahead and open it up now to the public. We So moved. Moved by Keith, second by Mr. Second. 
Uh, just a comment, just it's going to be a great addition to our community. Uh, it's a great way to get a building that's uh, been sat vacant for quite some time and underutilized. So uh, really excited for them, you know, coming to Fishers and uh, being a part of our community. So great job by uh, your team. Thank you. Aye. 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 Thank you again for the record, Megan Baumgartner, Director of Economic Development. Um, this resolution is part of our yearly compliance for companies and um, developments that have received some sort of abatement. So this could be the personal property tax abatement, real property tax abatement, and then we have um, a vacant building tax abatement in there as well. Um, we typically bring these before council in May or June, but as part of the governor's executive orders, it extended the deadline for companies required to submit their tax information, which then delayed this. Um, we have put together um, in your packet, you'll see all of the, um, the compliance forms that the company submitted, um, but we provided and put together this um, Excel spreadsheet to demonstrate where people are in their commitments to where um, they were supposed to have been. So the four to call out um, to council today, um, the first is Rubbermaid. It's now Rubbermaid was Darden, then was Newell Brands. Um, if you'll recall, when Cytel came to Fishers, um, Rubbermaid no longer needed a significant amount of their office space, relocated their staff to now the visionary building back by Launch Fishers. Um, and so they saw a reduction in their headcount at that specific location where we have their personal property tax abatement. Um, Republic Services, they, are, they have 398 employees and by the end of 2025, they need to meet their required headcount of 426. Um, from every indication from them, they're well on their way. Um, ThyssenKrupp was another company they have until the end of this year for their headcount commitment. Um, there are 84 employees currently, um, and their commitment is 150. Fisher's Ellipse, which is the VW building at the back of the Ellipse, um, they didn't have any tenants located in that building at the end of 2019, um, so there were no employees, and um, so they have until 2023, though, to meet their job commitments. They've signed a significant amount of um, new companies into that building, so we don't think that there will be any sort of issue hitting those commitments. Um, for Rubbermaid and Jardin, um, and as well as these other groups who um, might be below their future commitments for headcounts, um, I'm asking council tonight to consider approving all of these um, as many companies in our community are struggling right now um, and just as a way to help so show some support. Um, again, next year we would go through the same approval process and review of the compliance forms at that time. I think it's also important uh, to note for council's consideration, each time we enter into an economic development agreement with these organizations, we have traditional clawbacks that are afforded to us so that if in time there is an organization that doesn't meet the requirements, we have the tools within these economic development agreements to claw back on those abatements so that your vote of a substantial compliance demarcation does not waive that by any means. So Megan and her team still have the ability to monitor the Excel sheet that she just shared with you tonight, uh, also having the tools in her pocket to enforce uh, a clawback if that necessary step would occur in the future. So moved.
Thank you. Um, I do have a question about Rubbermaid. So I just want to be sure I understand. They're about 60% shy. No, they're about 40% shy of where they needed to be um, in terms of jobs by end of December of last year. Correct. Correct. So it's a yearly compliance so that every company reports forward. So um, if they are instead considered non-compliant, what does that look like? Because they're not compliant right now. So. Sure, that's a great question. Um, so in all of our abatements, um, if the council declines the acceptance of the compliance form for a certain company, typically the way that the agreement is stated is that they would come back for some sort of public hearing in front of council for you to then determine what the next step is. In all of our agreements, as Chris mentioned, we do have an, a clawback in there. For this one in particular, it's, they have to pay back one year of their previous um, personal property abatement that they received. Um, and then, um, so that's how it happens for each of these. So then it would be council's determination from my understanding that um, they would come back from the hearing or we've done it in the past for other abatements that we would terminate it in agreement for some sort of repayment. So if, if this body determines that they are indeed non-compliant, the next step, Megan, would be like a public hearing to understand where they fell short or why they fell short or moving forward what their outlook is. Is that correct? That is correct. I um, Admittedly, I haven't gone back to look at the Jardin agreement to see if there is any specific uh, requirement that would do anything additional, but generally that's how it operates with all of our agreements. I think it would be up to council to decide if it was a one-off meeting or if it would be back at the next council meeting. Um, but again, historically what has happened is if council said that this was not approved or you would want additional information, our economic development team would then work with the company to decide, okay, here's how we're going to terminate it um, and get that call back, whatever we decided. Okay. So I guess just a question for, the, for my fellow counselors is, why wouldn't we want to do that? Um, open it up to a conversation and a hearing to understand because they're remarkably short. Sure, and I will add just just to help share a little bit of their story. Even though they have reduced their headcount at that facility, they have now leased an additional 300,000 square feet of office space and are doing significant improvements in other locations. And again, back in the visionary. So. Um, I don't think that their total headcount in Fishers does reach the 292, but it does increase a little bit. So I just add that as a caveat of their investment and commitment to the city. I think uh, if I could weigh in here, <clears throat> this is a conversation many of you, it, it might predate the two new council members, but this was a conversation we had some time ago about these guys making some adjustments or, or moving to a different facility and doing additional capital investment. You know. Uh, my recommendation was be for you to hear directly from them. I don't think there's anything uh, wrong with that. What I wouldn't want to do is hold up all the other uh, items where people are in compliance or are substantially headed in the right direction. Um, but it would be nice to put this particular conversation around Jarden one way or another to bed. So if, if council would want to hear directly from them, we can do that. I would just separate these two out and, and approve the rest table theirs, bring them back if you want to hear directly from them. And then we do need to make a decision on these folks one way or another, because it has been um, been hanging out there for the better part of probably 12 months. So if that's, the, if that's the council's prerogative, I would just ask that you find the rest in compliance and then bring them back at another date. Yeah, so I guess my opinion is, and this was a much deeper conversation that we had along the way, and the additional investment that was being made by Rubbermaid at that point to go into additional areas around the, the city, uh, and they were very open with us about what was going on. You know, I, I'm also incredibly sensitive to, you know, the point in time where we're at with the pandemic and everything else going on. You know, we're at year five of a 10-year abatement. It's not like we're not going to be talking about these guys again next year to the point where if we don't see any kind of significant improvement maybe as we kind of climb through this pandemic phase, you know, and we start to see something there, we still have the opportunity to go in there and call them in and do a callback and do all the things that Chris talked about. This isn't a one-time shot 
that you have to kind of go back and, and figure out what it is. And I don't feel like calling anybody from any business up in front of us to have them explain what's going on with their business because I, I don't think anybody really has the knowledge of where they're heading at the moment, just witnessed by what we've got to deal with with our own budget coming up. So I'm going to be in favor of, of letting them go this year and letting them continue to operate. And let's take a look at it next year when the, the same reports come back again and make a decision then when we get another bite at the apple. So I, for one, would make a motion to approve the whole thing. So. Time. I, I hear you, and I, I think um, I, I think as long as as a council we appreciate probably not going to dramatically shift uh, in 2020. Um, that that's fine, and as long as as I agree what Pete said, if we can keep that door open, I think that conversation is important. So per, perhaps one idea here would be for Megan to send a letter to Jordan acknowledging the, the deficiency, so that we're on record. Saying yeah. that we we've, we've acknowledged it, but given these circumstances in this time, we're going to review uh, 12 months from now. So that at least, you know, we're on record saying that we're in full acknowledgement of what what's happening. So that okay. next year, if those numbers don't improve, we've got we've got some breadcrumbs back to. I would hope we do that on every company going forward, Scott. If we if we choose to let somebody move forward regardless of circumstances, because again, if I can read that correctly, I think it says five and ten, which were is that right? My eyes aren't that great. Yes. Uh, you know, plus the thing is super big, so I don't know how I can't read it. <laughs> um, you know, that that's my point is that we don't we do get another bite at this apple. We do get a chance to go call back. We do get a chance to you know tell them that you know you got to straighten up and fly right, or we're going to have to come back and do that. So. Any of these companies on the, on the foreseeable future should always get that letter putting them on record that they didn't comply, but the council saw fit not to do anything at this point in time, but reserves the right at a future date to do that. I, I would also like to see as part of that letter to just basically ask them, you know, we know we are on unprecedented times, but what is your plan to remedy the situation? And you know, we may have to take that with a grain of salt, but I guess it would be good to know if they had a plan and what that plan was. Sure. I think asking for some sort of written response in response to the letter is definitely something that we could do. And I'm sorry, just one last comment about the resolution in front of us. Um, it does say that every um, organization on the list has complied. And I think that's where my concern is to consider them compliant um, because they're not. Could it so be I, I, I don't know what we can, if, if the, the motion, um, forgive me, I'm gonna talk this out. If the motion needs to be just removing Rubbermaid from the list, therefore moving forward all the other um, organizations that are compliant probably would be a clean way to proceed. It's the substantially compliant part that I think we would talk about. And Chris, I don't know if it can be, because so when we look back through the compliance form, it we are saying that I mean, and with Jarden, we did say that the property owner is not in substantial compliance, but I think that this resolution is accepting that the council acknowledges it's not in compliance, but we are still moving forward and accepting them to continue. Let, let me see compliance. if I can put this into a motion. So mm -hmm. I'll move that we that we approve everybody is in substantial compliance with the tax abatement forms, with the exception of Rubbermaid, who we find not to be in substantial compliance, but don't plan on taking any action other than you know, written action which will comply from staff, uh, okay, in this report. That's my motion. A motion on the table, isn't it? That's correct. I don't think I made it. That's correct. Did I? So we so can, I would make we can 
Council, Council President Coble, we can just make this a friendly amendment if the Council's uh, uh, open to that uh, for Council Peterson's motion, uh, as he stated. I would second Pete's motion. A second. Uh, we have a second. Thank you, Council President Coble. For the record, Chris Greisel, attorney for the City of Fishers. I think somebody asked earlier tonight what else the Health Department does, and uh, before you is a lot of that what else. Um, so Ordinance uh, 061520A is the second reading of the initial phase of our health code, and it covers five chapters as they relate to the retail food establishments, public pools, septic tanks, communicable diseases, and then there's a miscellaneous fee schedule. Uh, last month, the council gave first reading of that ordinance, and since that time, there's been various edits that have been tracked for your uh, review and consideration. By and large, those edits uh, were clerical or implemented to provide further consistency throughout each chapter. The health department has a number of folks in the field right now who are working with respect to various uh, issues as they relate to these codes that are being brought before you, uh, and there are a lot of practical considerations in their day-to-day -day flow of how they work. Uh, which is reflected in uh, the new red line versions which are before you. As I mentioned during our, our first reading, the health department operates under the purview of three separate laws and rules. We have state statute, the Indiana Administrative Code, and then you have uh, local department regulations that may be added. In general, Indiana law provides health departments with broad authority that are further specified by that administrative code, which is promulgated by the State Department of Health. Local codes, which are the final layers are primarily established to permit certain activity within our community and collect fees for those permits, um, to uh, apply an additional local mechanism for addressing non-compliant activity, which can come in the form of fines, permit suspension, permit revocation, or other civil action, and by choosing to be more restrictive uh, than certain aspects of the administrative code. Tonight, for your consideration, we have the initial five chapters of the health code as they pertain to retail food establishments, public pools, septic tanks, communicable diseases, and a miscellaneous fee schedule. And I'll just kind of go over them uh, very generally. Uh, chapter 170, which is the food code, uh, requires all retail food establishments to be permitted within the city of Fishers. It requires any construction or renovation of a food establishment to be submitted to the city's plan review process. So there is an, uh, an additional local plan review process that is submitted to for these retail food establishments within Fishers. It allows our health officer to inspect the food establishment as frequently as deemed necessary, and it provides a procedure for violations, which includes fines, permit suspension, or revocation. Chapter 171, which is the pool code, requires all pools and fishers to be permitted. It supplements the Indiana Administrative Code by requiring certain sampling and testing uh, to be performed and chemicals to be maintained at certain levels. It allows our health officer as well to inspect pools and provides a procedure for violations, fines, permit revocation, suspension, et cetera. Chapter 172, which is the septic code, uh, it doesn't really have a large applicability to the city of Fishers. However, we do still have a few septic systems within our community. So if a resident cannot hook on to the public sewer, Chapter 172 provides the process by which an applicant can get permitted for a new septic tank, and it provides a process for inspection. So we still do have uh, some areas, some residential areas, non-commercial areas, but residential areas within our community that still run into septic issues from time to time. 
Chapter 173, which is Monica's bread and butter, is the communicable disease code, uh, which requires the reporting of communicable diseases to the health department. In addition uh, to the powers provided by Indiana law, it provides the health officer with the ability to institute measures for the protection of other persons from infection via quarantine or another mechanism. And then finally, Chapter 180 covers miscellaneous fees of the department which include vital records, personal health services, and private water. I would suspect that that fee um, ordinance that is before you will continue to be updated as we go on as a department uh, throughout the remainder of this year. As you may have noticed, uh, there are individual fee mechanisms within the Retail Food Establishment Code, the Pool Code, and some others. This miscellaneous fee is kind of a standalone section right now because we do not have a private water chapter that we're bringing before you. Uh, that'll be forthcoming, a uh, residential housing chapter and an enforcement chapter as well. So um, this really is the first phase of other phases to come uh, with respect to the, the health department code. Uh, so with that, um, I would anticipate again, periodically we'll be before you throughout the remainder of the year to update this health code, but we are happy to answer any questions that you may have over a lot of dense information that I've provided. So moved. And it is final, Chris, tonight then? Well, tonight is for second reading, but you can choose to vote on it if you like. Okay, so I'm not on, is it, do we have a third reading that's mandatory? Do I need to suspend the rule? No. No, okay. Mm -hmm. Then a motion to approve item 11. Hi. Thank you very much. So we move on to item 12 0 Good evening, uh, Ethan Lee, Director of Human Resources. I'm here before you tonight to request an amendment to the city's 2020 salary ordinance. Uh, Indiana Code requires the city legislative body um, by ordinance shall fix the annual compensation of each city position. The city uses a biweekly salary schedule to establish the maximum salary for each position under this ordinance. This, amendments, uh, this amendment would uh, update the salary ordinance to include two full-time positions created under the Fisher City Health Department. Those positions are public health director and environmental health supervisor. The amendment would also add a part-time health department support staff wage category to capture any part-time staff hired under the health department. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So moved. Uh, moved by, uh, second by Todd. Okay, so all those in favor of suspending the rule say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion? I will now, uh, Just do a motion to approve. Vote on so. I'll make a motion to approve item 12. I'll second it. Okay, moved by second by Todd. All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, for the record, Lisa Bradford, City Controller. The item before you uh, approves a lease between the Redevelopment Authority and the Redevelopment Commission with respect to Geist Park. As the council may recall, a few years ago, we purchased the last developable land in the Geist area with the intent to build the park. 
And so that is what this um, bond will go for. It is structured as a ban, which is a bond anticipation note. So therefore we can start um, work on Geist Park immediately and then the full debt service will come on when we fully finance the bond. Um, it's an amount not to exceed $16 million. And as we discussed at Finance Committee, our goal will be, and we will be able to make this tax rate neutral for our citizens with some debt that rolls off in the year we permanently finance. There's a couple things I might want to just add a little color on this. And I appreciate John and, and the Finance Committee as we work through this. Um, the nature of this project is unique in that there's so much permitting that needs to be done and it will take an extended period of time. So the design and permitting component of this project could take up to 12 months to accomplish. Anytime you're interfering with waterways, it just requires you to go through DNR, Army Corps, uh, IDEM, there's a number of different organizations. The procurement model that we used in this particular case is really was really attractive to us because it allowed us to bring on the design and engineering team early on in the, in the project so that we can really work collectively together to bring down costs, find synergies in the design through the permitting process. And then ultimately, we were also able to use that procurement model to delay payment until such time that other debt was rolling off the city's uh, amortization schedules, which then allowed us to not have any kind of tax implication on our residents. So we're very, very excited about the opportunity to hit the ground running on phase one of this park. And when I say phase one, I want you to understand that this park was purchased with a vision for the next 50 years. So just because it's phase one doesn't mean that you have to immediately do phase two. Phase one in this park will be uh, a world-class park uh, in itself, and it may be 10, 15 years before phase two happens, and that's okay. Uh, but we really do think there's an opportunity here to get going, get design, get permitting done, get construction underway, uh, and still keep a tax neutral perspective for our residents. And, uh, you know, we had a great conversation at the Finance Committee the other night about how to uh, accomplish that, and, and we look forward to moving forward. So moved, and this is being done under build, operate, transfer model, Scott. That's correct. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Now that we have a second letter, I'm on to questions. I do have a, um, I just wanted to initiate a little bit more conversation about this. Um, my concern is definitely the timing of this project when the municipality's finances are so uncertain. Um, even though it's deferred to 2024, it's making a huge commitment uh, at this moment for uh, four years down the line. And um, I'm very concerned about the status of, uh, among other uncertainties, of course, the State Road 37 project um, budget going over. So um, I I'm interested in understanding what could happen if we table this tonight and just wait until State Road 37 in just a few months will be able to be bid out and we at least have that piece understood. Um, again, I'm initiating that conversation because I don't know the answer to that. So uh, what's on the table right now, according to um, several different experts, NDOT, the engineering firms that are involved all believe that been, what's been articulated is a worst case scenario on State Road 37. And the Finance Committee the other night also planned for the worst case scenario on State Road 37 uh, regarding any kind of financial overruns. We believe that number will actually come down, but we're gonna plan for, plan for the worst. Uh, so from my perspective, and also just to clarify, State Road 37, the last bid for State Road 37 will occur sometime next spring or early summer for 141st Street. So for you to have the final, final numbers, it would require you to have about a 12 month delay in this project, which uh, we've made a significant investment in the park already, and we'd like to see the, those wheels start turning sooner rather than later. Um, we do feel confident that we've done the homework and done the research. The taxes that are gonna be pledged to this particular bond, including this and State Road 37 are our most stable taxation uh, revenue source. 
it's property taxes, and those don't fluctuate nearly like what we're seeing with income taxes. And also, if you're thinking to yourself, well, uh, if things decline, we'll need those property tax revenues to pay for operations. That's not actually available to us either under Indiana law. That can only be used for debt. So it's a specific tax rate associated with debt. So when you add all those factors in place, I certainly understand the concern, but we think we've put together an adequate plan that mitigates any downside risk due to any kind of economic or foreseen economic downturns. I, I appreciate that. Is, um, is there any further information? Um, forgive me, I think I'm a 10,000 foot view kind of person. Sure. Um, there's been a, a discussion about um, investing in a new fire station on the east side of town to service Del Webb and neighboring communities. I, uh, as we look at this particular project, which is an amazing project, but it's a nice to have project, what, what implications does it have moving forward on other yeah. uh, more necessary sure. items? Uh, we feel confident that we can achieve all of the associated capital projects. Now, if you want to start talking about the operational costs associated with the new fire station, the expanded personnel, and a an anticipated year where we may see a 10 or 20 percent decline in income tax revenues, that's a different conversation. Right. Um, so I would be, if I were in your guys' shoes, I'd be far more concerned about your ability to pay for payroll of firemen or policemen than I would be about the brick and mortar at this mm -hmm. point, just by the revenue streams. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go ahead and call for a vote on our resolution for the Aye. Aye. Nay. We're now moving on to item number three. This is uh, any, uh, any other unfinished business or new business, unfinished or new business that we want to consider? No? Okay. Can I, I'm sorry, President Kobold, can I just make a quick comment? Um, during our recess, um, there there is information about how the live stream for the great presentation we just had with the health department was not working. Um, I'm bringing this up now just to ask the question in terms of like unfinished business. Is there any way that um, residents who are trying to tune in could see it later or is it, it was just a great presentation yeah, and the so community we were, is hungry for this yeah, information. So we were aware of those technology glitches and that's why we took the recess so that our IT department could reset and help out the public who's watching. We'll make the uh, PowerPoint available, and I'm sure Monica will uh, be able to have other forums where she can educate the public on exactly what she did tonight to the council and what she did on Friday to the health department as well. And perhaps, Ashley, we can work on some sort of video of Monica and Dr. Lane talking through the PowerPoint, and then we can release that. So, yes, we're painfully aware of the technology gaps that we had tonight. We're going to work through those. Could you like put it on, you know, we have a YouTube channel, correct? We could put something up there, right? Yeah, we'll get something out. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes. We're uh, working through that as we speak. So moved. Second. Second. 